Shalom and welcome to In the Beginning. I'm Rabbi Eric Tokager with Brit Am Messianic Synagogue in Pensacola, Florida. And my co-host, Wayne Leland, Rabbi of Am Israel Messianic Synagogue in Navarre, Florida. And we want to thank you for tuning in this morning. The phone number here to participate in the program is... Uh, 623-1330 623-1330 or you can visit our Facebook page In the Beginning Radio Program that's In the Beginning Radio Program our program's purpose is to share the things of the Word of God and the Word of God from an In the Beginning perspective starting with the book of Genesis and working through the book of Revelation not picking and choosing or pulling verses out of context but reading the Word of God in the direction God gave it to us, starting at the beginning and working to the end, and not just reading the last third of the book to see what the book says. I want to also thank once again Natasha Krauss Reynolds, Tamara Alexander, and Jonathan Lane for that beautiful song that opens and closes our program. And you can find out more about Natasha and Tamara by going to their CD Baby pages and look up their name, Tamara Aaron Alexander and Natasha Krauss Reynolds. I also want to very quickly wish Natasha's little girl happy birthday after the radio program this afternoon. I'll be going by and visiting with her little girl who's uh, turning or having a birthday this week. And uh, thanks to... uh, Natasha for being such a wonderful part of our family and community as well as Tamara who actually I saw today and she may get upset about this but I on the way here this morning uh, Rabbi Wayne I saw Tamara she crossed right in front of me on the the road she was out doing her morning exercise so uh, so she didn't see me or I think she was intent on her running this morning but it was good to see her up and about this morning And she has a wonderful family also. So it was good to see her on the way into the station. The phone number is 623-1330. I also wanted to say uh, that both Rabbi Wayne and I are available to teach at your congregation. If your uh, church or your synagogue is looking for someone that can share, especially with the upcoming fall feast, which are a little later this year than, uh, than normal, uh, with of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and, and Sukkot or the Feast of Trumpets and Day of Atonement and Tabernacles coming up. Uh, if you would like for either of us to come out and share uh, about Messiah in the biblical feast, about the biblical feast, about their uh, the context of them as it uh, relates to our faith in Yeshua, I know that uh, that both of us would be glad to come out yeah. and share at your congregation. You can find us by going to our websites, either Shalom Pensacola or Shalom Navarre, and just uh, contact us through the website to uh, set up a time for us to come out and share at Amen. your congregation. Lots of things going on in the world uh, today, Rabbi Wayne, but you know what amazes me is no matter what changes in the world, no matter what direction happens, you know, we have Islamic terrorism that's uh, reared its ugly head. We have political discourse going on and arguments about who's the the mo- best candidate for positions in our communities, in our cities, in our states, and, and nationally. We just finished the Republican convention uh, last week, and this week starts the Democratic convention, and the candidates will all make their promises and statements about what they're going to do, and uh, wars around the world, and famine around the world, and, and all of these things going on. But, you know, it doesn't matter that time changes. The uh, the things that we're seeing are the same things that have been around since the beginning of time. Wars uh, and rumors of wars, people taking care of each other or not taking care of each other, leaders rising up with this statement that they uh, have the answer for all the things of the world, all the problems of the world, and, and if we just 
turn to them, they can bring about what needs to be happening. And so, you know, it, it's not a, a thing that changes, time changes, but uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, and we need to be aware that when we look at these things, we shouldn't get discouraged, we shouldn't get fearful, we shouldn't get downtrodden, we shouldn't get any of those things. Uh, we should look up for our redemption draws nigh. Mm -hmm. We should have faith in, in what the Lord says. And, and as we uh, are studying this week in uh, Parsha Balach in our synagogues, this you know, every... Uh, for our new listeners, every week there's a portion of the Torah, or a portion of the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, that are read so that each year there's a cycle that allows us to read all of the different portions, all of the sections, so all, the entirety of the Torah in a year cycle. And so this week we're reading the book, uh, or the Parsha Balak, which is in the book of Numbers chapter uh, 22, beginning at verse 2, and uh, and in the events in Balak, it's very similar to what's happening in our world today. In many ways, uh, things, like I said, don't change. And so it begins with the words in Balak, the son of Zephor, uh, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was very afraid of the people because they were many, and Moab was distressed because of the people of Israel. And one of the things I want to say is we have allowed... Um, the enemy, the, the world, to uh, deceive us into forgetting that we are many. You know, there are more believers or people that claim to be believers in the Bible in the United States than there are those that claim to not believe in the Bible. And yet we have allowed the deception that the, the those against us are more powerful than those that are with us, and we forget that he that is in us is greater than he that's in the world. We forget that the world is supposed to be afraid of Israel, of the people of God, of those that are, are born again, those that are part of the commonwealth of Israel. And the world is constantly trying to get ways to curse the people of God. But uh, there's no curse that can come on the people of God from outside of the people of God. We can cause curses to come on ourselves, but we have the authority. We have God's promises behind us, and we should not be afraid. The world should be afraid of the power of God flowing through us, not the other way around. Amen. And that's important for us to note. You know, here we have Balak, the king of Moab, who is so afraid of the children of Israel that he goes to Balaam or Balaam, and the king knew that physically they couldn't defeat Israel. Uh, but he wanted to find out, is there a way to spiritually weaken them to the point at which then they could defeat them? And so that's what's happening. The same thing that's happening today. We're, we're looking, at, and the world knows they can't defeat the body of Messiah, the people are sinful, or maybe I should accept the things that are sinful because I feel bad for them, or, or I love them because their mother was weakened by the Moabite women coming into the camp, and both of the adults who were pretending or, or acting as if they were married had to sleep in separate beds, mm -hmm. and they had to keep at least one foot on the ground at all time during this. And, and so incrementally we went from that where they wouldn't allow it even to appear appearance, but to anything, and to now today where during prime time, during time where families are, uh, not only are there men and women shown having relationships, but there are men with men and women with women, and, and they're pushing the envelope even further and further. Now this is an incremental thing. If, if they had tried to show a movie or a TV show of today, back in the 50s, people would have burned down the television yeah. stations. But incrementally, it's like the frog being boiled. It, it just turned up the heat just a little at a time, and they'd just be satisfied with a little at a time. And we have, as believers, allowed sin to become more acceptable, more acceptable, more acceptable, more acceptable, until now things that if somebody did some of the things that have happened 
in our recent church services today, 30 years ago, they'd have been run out of town, they'd have been tarred and feathered, they, you know, there'd been horrendous response to it, and yet uh, today we have things going on that are just unbelievably ungodly in the in the services. We're not talking about in the bar across the street. Uh, we're talking about in the congregations where we have, uh, you know, ordination of homosexuals and gay marriage and, and all this stuff happening in congregations that proclaim to believe in the Bible. And it, it's shocking, but it's because we have gradually accepted a diversion from God's Word uh, formula. You know, Rabbi Eric, it's uh, like you said when the plague took place. Uh, it was only stopped after Phoenix went in, and uh, he put a stop to it by uh, by killing the uh, Israelite and the Moab- Moabite woman that literally came in front of the tabernacle, like you said, and went into the tent in front of Moses. And that's how it's gotten to today. It's got where people have no shame at all to come right with uh, Christian today. Um, in. As if they're, yeah. you know, these great sins, but, you know, um, not loving people is a sin. Sure. Being uh, judgmental is a sin uh, in the wrong way. Now, we're supposed to judge certain things, but I'm talking about judging salvation rather than judging sin. We can't judge salvation of people. We can judge the fruit of what they're doing. Um, right. Lying, cheating, stealing. <laughs> Uh, you know, Yeshua said, if you look on a woman to lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Uh, if you say to some that you hate them, you've committed murder in your heart. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to really deal with in order to be the body that we're supposed to be. But these things come in. We open the door to this, uh, these sins when we open the door to those little things. In other words, if you allow hatred to come into your heart, and, you know, there's, there's, I'll give you an example. I was talking with some believers this week about the election. And regardless of which side you like or don't like, whether it's Trump or Clinton, I've heard believers talk with hatred against the people. Not against some of the things they've done, but against the people. And all right. the way to, all the way to the point of, you know, if I could get a hold of them, I would just kill them or, or we should, wow. that very, and this is from believers. You know, I'm not, we can't talk about people that are unbelievers, sin or sin. We have an expectation that's going to happen. But believers, uh, we need to be careful because if we allow that hatred to come into our lives, it opens the door to greater sin and, and more sin and, and, that's what's happening is we have opened the door uh the the doors wide of our synagogues and our congregations and churches to welcome ungodly behavior and once you open the door to one it's kind of like letting the salesman stick his foot in the door once the doors open uh then more things come in and we become more accepting of yeah. of sin, sins that we were less accepting of before because we've already are caught in one. You know, that brings up a question that I had. I mean, in reality, there are scriptures, plenty of scriptures, you know. Matter of fact, we're about getting ready to go into Devarim, Deuteronomy, in our Parsha, <clears throat> and you know, we're gonna, we learn all about what's right and what, what's not, or what's the, you know, what's right to do, but how do we apply it because it's been so washed out? You know, so many people want to believe that everything's okay and we have this universal, you know, system where everybody can do what they want to do. I mean... Right. One of the things that's really important, I know Rabbi Wayne wants to say something, but one of the things we need to remember is that the the hero of the story of Balak and Balaam is not the donkey. It's God. Right. And if you look, this is a demonstration of God's mercy and grace without accepting sin. In other words, we look at at uh, Billam's experience. He's he's having a he gets a, a message from the Lord. He he constantly is talking to the Lord, but at the same time, he is rejecting God's counsel. He's trying to do the things God doesn't want him to do. He goes the wrong places. He's going to do the wrong things. But over and over, God stops him 
and tries to steer him back into doing the right thing. Not once does God say, okay, well, if, you know, maybe I misunderstood, maybe I was too harsh, maybe my laws were too grievous, maybe it was too difficult, I'll let you go ahead and right. do what you want. Over and over, the Lord tells Balaam, this is wrong and you need to get back to doing the right. All the way to the point of the uh, angel coming and uh, standing and, and the Lord saying, you're, if it wasn't for your donkey uh, stopping, then I would have killed you because right. of your rebellion and because of your heart and because of the perversion that you've allowed to come into you and, and all of that. But over and over, the Lord shows mercy, but not acceptance of sin. Mm -hmm. And that's really the lesson of Balak, the Parsha, is that we as the body of Messiah have to be careful that we don't uh, mistake or redefine mercy to be accepting of sin. Right. Mercy is God's way to keep us and draw us back to him away from sin, not to accept us. He saves us from our sin, not in our sins. And uh, so that's real important. Rabbi Wayne? Yeah, I was, I was going to share something here. There's a scripture that says that... Uh, God shall not not be mocked as a man soweth that shall he also reap and reaping also can be a term uh, I use all the time when I'm sharing in in, the, in studies is uh, there are consequences uh, there are good consequences for obedience to God obeying His word and we have to be responsible as teachers rabbis pastors whatever our, our goal or whatever our our office is that God has placed us in to teach the word of God to stand on the word of God. To teach the difference between clean and unclean, between that that's sin and that that's not sin, that is our job as leaders to do. And if we fail to do that, we're going to be held to a higher standard of consequences from God. It also refers to we'll walk in His blessings if we do right. Uh, there will be curses that we cause we open the door up and invite the curses in if we do wrong. But there is a procedure because in this case today, uh, with what. Uh, with what Phoenix did to stop these people in this sin and this plague, because it would have killed everybody in there if he hadn't acted. He was in the house of Israel. He was in a setting, as Rabbi Eric said, to where he had the right to act the way he acted. We are not in that setting today. We are in different nations right. with different laws. And so, biblically, though, in every nation, as a congregation and believers in Messiah, we have a procedure where if someone is doing wrong and say you see someone in the body doing wrong and you're the only one that sees it you have a responsibility with the right kind of love to go try to win that person and say listen you know this is not right and if you win your brother that should be the end of it however if that doesn't work and the person is uh, is doing things that are detrimental not only to their self but could be detrimental to the body then you have a responsibility to go get someone else and take them back and deal with it Ultimately, if the person doesn't make it right. So we see here there's grace and mercy, just like Rabbi Eric just said, that God uses us he, uh, to, to try to win that person, to show mercy, to bring that person back into right standing that's faltering away. Ultimately, if the person refuses, you have to put them outside the camp, the body of Messiah, and let God deal with them because they're to be considered as a, as a tax gatherer or a sinner, is what the Scripture says. And so even at that, though, the idea is is that through if it goes to that if it goes that far, uh, you do that for the protection of the rest of the body to not say it's okay because if we don't act as leaders and apply this scripture today, then we're saying it's okay for sin to do to, to continue in the camp. We as leaders have to do that, and it's not just the leader; it's all of us who are responsible and understand this that we have a responsibility to love one another. And that really is loving one another, to take a righteous stand in that manner with hopes of restoration to bring that person back to right standing with God. Right, and one of the things I want to point out, Rabbi Wayne just gave a, a uh, little teaching on uh, Matthew yeah. 18. And, I, and some of our listeners may have listened and said, hey, that, that's good teaching, that's important. Where do I find yeah, biblical basis for that? Right. That's in Matthew 18 where it says if you have ought against somebody, you're to go to that person and tell them what's going on, and then if they don't accept your counsel and, and turn from their sin, then you go to the elders, and you have the elders go with you, and then if they don't accept them, then they are put out. Uh, again, not 
to stop people from praying for them or loving them, but in order to stop it from spreading and causing sin to uh, sh- to spread throughout the body. Uh, well, acceptance of uh, things that the Torah and the Bible tells us not to do. One of the other things I wanted to say in this case is this situation today with the prophet Balaam, a Gentile prophet, was that he was a prophet for hire. And even though he spoke to God, just because God speaks to someone doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing the right thing. God will yep. use anybody, and the thing of it is is that is, is we have too many hirelings today. It's called hirelings. Watch out now. A hireling within the, within the pulpits with, at the Bemas, you know, that are there and would not be there if they was not getting paid. And therefore, they don't have a problem with doing whatever it takes to keep the money yeah. flowing in. But real men and women of God are going to speak truthful no matter where they get paid or don't get paid. They're going to stand on God's word and they're going to, and they're going to uh, uh, abide by God's word. And this is what we have to have today. We have to have true leaders in the congregations, uh, in the churches, in, in, in the synagogues that are going to stand on God's word and hold people to the word of God and hold themselves to the word of God. Absolutely. And not only that, if, if you are a hireling if, and if money is your motivation for doing what you're doing, then depending on who is giving the most is how you base what you're teaching on and what you'll preach against That's right. rather than preaching against sin no matter who's giving or what's going on. And and we see examples of hirelings uh, throughout the scripture where the king would say, I need, you know, what what should I do? And the real prophet would say, don't do this. And then he'd go to other prophets who wanted to please him and say what they, you know, so then they'd say, you know, do what you want to do. And and the same thing's happening today in congregations. We see, now now I want to be clear because the size of a congregation isn't determined by whether the pastor or the rabbi is a hireling or not. That's true. It's the health of the congregation Absolutely. that's judged by that, that we can judge that by. Because you can have a honest, biblical uh, teacher who's teaching truth and teaching against sin, and that will bring people to God. Amen. True repentance brings revival, and revival causes growth to come to the congregation. Or you can have large congregations where the people go because they just their ears get tickled. They get to hear what they want to hear. They get to feel like they did something religious. They get to feel like they're part of something, and then they go on. So it's important that we don't say, well, this person has a large congregation, they must be a hireling. When we, have to, we can look at the fruit, we can look at the, res, at the teaching. Is he teaching against sin, or are they accepting sin and teaching against God? Amen. That's true. Amen. So well, that's, listen, brother, I'm going to let you all go. Um, I can finish the radio program on the off, off the air. Okay, I appreciate it. Hey, is, you, is your live stream working where you are? Yeah, mine is. Okay, yeah. good. Because the internet is down here in the booth, and I can't tell whether it's going out or not. So I yeah, appreciate it's kind of body, but yeah, it's there. Okay, I appreciate it. Look, give love to your family, and uh, come see us when you're in the area. We will. Thank you. Shavuot okay. Shavuot. 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 The phone number here is 623-1330, 623-1330. You know, Rabbi Wayne, as we talk about these things, these are relevant issues to us uh, globally. Mm-hmm. The, the, the world is being overtaken in a large way by uh, false religions, whether it be um, uh, humanism or whether it be uh, atheism or whether it be Islam or whether, you know, whatever it is that's contrary to the message of God. We don't serve uh, the same God as an atheist, we don't serve the same God as a humanist, and we don't serve the same God as an Islamist. We serve the God of the Bible, the God of Genesis through Revelation, and we don't and shouldn't become accepting or um, allow people to say things like, oh, we all serve the same God. We don't. Or, you know, if, if your God teaches contrary to what the Bible says, we're not teaching and believing in the same God. And tolerance doesn't mean I have to accept the false premise that, 
your God is the same as my God. Tolerance says I have to accept you have the right and the ability to believe in your God. But it doesn't mean I have to accept it or accept the teachings of it or live in a way that demonstrates my tolerance of your teachings. Uh, it does mean that I have to, in our nation, where people have freedom of religion, accept that you have the constitutional right to believe something different. But it, you don't have the constitutional right to make me believe what you believe. That's right or to accept that and we have opened door after door after door to these things and we need to be careful that we don't let the uh, our faith be diminished by the lies of this world that would do the exact same thing that Balaam told Balak to do to Israel which is to let little things enter the camp until they become big things and let Israel diminish their strength and power by being out of the covering of God's Torah and Word. Neil Rabbi, I'd like to share uh, in the last part of our parts of the day another circumstance that took place here that's very important, which involves leadership as well. And it says in 25, uh, chapter 25, uh, start with verse 1 of Numbers, While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. For they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined, and this means intimately, this actually the people, not all of Israel, but the people who did, joined themselves to Baal, or another term for Hasatan, Satan, the, the, uh, of, of Peor, and Yodavah, the Lord, was angry against Israel. And it says next, this is important, and Yodavah, the Lord, said to Moshe, take all the leaders of the people, the leaders now of the people of the Israelites and execute them in broad daylight before Yodeh so that the fierce anger of Yodeh may turn away from Israel. So the leaders that were responsible for overseeing the people and keeping them in check, making sure that they did not go and do what, be involved in this sin, did not take their stand. They allowed them to go over there and get involved in this. And the way God dealt with this was he dealt with the leaders specifically first and to bring things in check. So what we want to see here is that that's why leadership is so important, is that we as leaders must teach the whole Word of God. We must warn the people. We're not going to tolerate uh, ungodliness within the, within the kingdom of God, within the congregations of God. If you're going to do that and you're going to be in your rebellion, and the whole world's in rebellion today. It's in rebellion against God. When people rebelled against Moses, it was always clearly stated, and Moses said, Who am I? Who is Aaron? You're not rebelling against me. You're rebelling against God. When we come against a true man and woman of God that is ministering the word of God and wanting the people not to be involved in that sin, we're coming directly against God in rebellion. And we see that happening all the time. It's time for leaders to stand up. Be the men and women of God. They, they should be irregardless of what's going to happen because God will be protecting you because he has chosen you to do that work. Amen. I want to ask a favor of our listeners, especially if you're listening by the Internet, and that is we're not sure what, how it's working today, or at least I'm not, where it seems spotty. So if you are listening on the Internet and you can hear me right now, if you would go to our Facebook page, In the Beginning Radio Program, and just text something in there that says, I can hear you, or it's spotty, or whatever's going on, so we know what's happening on the other end of this thing. Uh, and we'll continue on with our program, which is sponsored and supported by the Messianic communities across the Gulf Coast. One of those is Rabbi Wayne's congregation, which is... Am Israel Messianic Synagogue, and we meet at 9255 Military Trail in Navarre, Florida. Uh, to find out more about us, you can go to shalomnavar.com. Again, that is shalomnavar.com. We have a weekly Sabbath service every Saturday. Uh, we start, we get there about 1 o'clock. Uh, come to our service, if you would, and also a weekly uh, Bible study on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. It's an interactive Bible study. We'd love to have you to come join us. So uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Amen. And uh, I'd like to invite you to come out and join us at Brit Am 
Messianic Synagogue. Bridam meets at 6700 Spanish Trail in Pensacola. And you can find out more about us by going to shalompensacola.com. We have several upcoming events, but the largest one is coming up in October, and that is our Sukkah Fest uh, celebration, the celebration of Sukkot. And this year we're having special guests come in to lead worship. Kira Goldman's going to lead worship for us. And then Rabbi Frank Lowinger from Buffalo, New York, is going to be one of our speakers. And we're looking forward to that. And if you would like to help sponsor our Sukkah Fest, if you'll contact us at Brit Um uh, by going to shalompensacola.com, we'll let you know how you can support Sukkah Fest by advertising in our program for the, uh, the, the celebration. And what we do is we try to... Uh, cover all of the costs for Sukkah Fest by advertising, by getting local sponsors to support it, so that all of the donations that are given during Sukkah Fest, because we take up donations each service, those donations are given to ministries in Israel to help share the gospel, to help reach out to people in Israel. So if you'd like to sponsor our Sukkah Fest uh, celebration, you can contact us by going to shalompensacola.com and just send us a note. And uh, Seth, welcome to the program. Thank you, Rabbi. Shalom. And Shalom. Rabbi Wayne, Shalom. 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 Bless you. Question. Uh, the concept of, quote, being lost and the choice of that word has always kind of intrigued me. Uh, I guess it's because... Uh, it doesn't necessarily carry the connotation of hopelessness. It's just lost, like any of us can lose our way. And I guess my question is, what do you do with a congregational leader who may be teaching, well, for example, Chris Lam or some other uh, theology, uh, and who may be, uh, how should you say, not following the Scriptures, uh, since we can't take them out and kill them, uh, I guess maybe they have to be removed from their position of leadership. Well, now, now, first of all, I want you to say it's not that you can't take them out and kill them. It just wouldn't be biblical. <laughs> it just wouldn't be biblical to do that. It wouldn't be right. So I just want to state that to begin with. The other thing I want to say is that it's really important that we understand that there are differences in words. Words have meanings. Words are important, in the, especially when we're dealing with biblical words. Biblical yeah. words are important. So we talk about the concept of being lost. We first have to define that. Does it yeah. mean lost as in what happens here or lost as in eternal? Because those are two different things. There are lots of people that are what we would describe as lost, or as you described, you know, misplaced in the woods. They're trying to find their way to where yes. they need to go. And that is everybody who's alive right now that hasn't blasphemed the Ruach HaKodesh or the Holy Spirit. So that, that's, the, you know, all the people that are there, including, by the way, many people that profess faith in Yeshua are still trying to find their way to him just as I'm trying to find my way closer to him but I'm walking hopefully in the light of his word which helps me to have a clear path to him the goal is to get to him uh, and so that that's important the other thing is lost which would be the eternal which would be when those that rejected the way of salvation through Messiah Yeshua uh, will spend eternity apart from God in a eternal punishment and what that eternal punishment is can be a discussion for another another uh, phone call but yeah. so so those two things are important the other thing is we constantly we're com constantly hear people using the word saved when I would uh, say that people today that have faith in Yeshua have been redeemed and then when they cross the spiritual or figurative Jordan into the world to come, they will be saved. Uh, the scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And so we are in the place of redemption right now. But when we die or when he comes to get us, whichever happens first, at that point, we'll go from the position of being redeemed to the position of being saved. He that endures to the end 
the same shall be saved. So, so those are important concepts that we need to know and uh, know the difference of. You know, it remi- so, reminds me of the, uh, the uh, I forget what you call them, the old line Baptists anyway. They, they, their, one of our teachings was we're being saved. We have been redeemed and we're in the process of being saved. Like Rabbi Eric said, so it's very, very interesting to, uh, the way we look at things. And so, those are important concepts. Then Paul, when he talks about, uh, as best I remember, work out their own salvation, apparently he's referring to wending our way through the various things we encounter in life and not being drawn off course and figuring out what to accept and what to reject. Exactly. To, get to our destination. Exactly. It's it's you know the scripture says study to show yourself approved, approved a workman. Yes. And so it, it's a matter of you know every day I get up when I start reading my scriptures, and I ask the Lord to show me where I'm wrong so I can be right to to illuminate His word in a way that I can draw myself closer to Him so that He can be the the uh, Molder the artist, the sculptor that sculpts the clay of my life to align with His Word, and you know it's an everyday thing. It's it's constant. You know, Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul said, "I die daily," and it's a constant thing that we are uh, being molded and conformed to His image. Yeah, he also it, said, "I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith," and that was led from the crown of righteousness. Right. Is it fair to say that this, how should you say, liberal view and or, uh, I'll refer to it as progressivism, or uh, tolerance has worked its way into congregations and churches through liberal leaders that perhaps should not be teaching? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So how do you, if, let's say, uh, as you say, the cemeteries teach (laughs) this liberal approach, how can you combat that on an educational level? The way to combat bad teachers is to educate good students, uh, to get people to actually read the Bible. You know, I don't have to go and have a debate with a teacher that teaches Chrislam or a teacher that teaches uh, other things like that. If I can just tell people to actually read their Bible and get them to do that, the Bible will win the debate because the Bible is accurate and clear. It's men's teaching that's the problem. And if somebody is going to a congregation and they're being taught something that's contrary to the Bible, contrary to biblical values, biblical teaching, then the way they can get... That, that taken care of isn't to kill the pastor or uh, it's to leave that congregation and go somewhere where they're going to hear uh, teaching from the Bible that agrees with the Bible and, and adheres to those things the Bible teaches. So let the congregation, so to speak, uh, what? Die? Yeah, the, if, if, the everybody leaves, if everybody leaves the congregation then there's nobody there to be affected by that. You know, very similar, Last, uh, the Thursday before last, there was a guy that uh, wanted to say a, a prayer at the, uh, at the city council meeting. Yes. My advice was that nobody go, because he has no authority, no power, no, you know, if nobody's there, who's he going to affect by doing what he does? Only him. Uh, but instead and you're not of publicizing him, at the right? Same and time, you're not right? promoting him or publicizing him. The news media has no story. There's no Facebook posts. There's no none of that stuff happens because this guy doesn't get what he wants. What he wants is people that will listen to what he says and talk about it. It's kind of like don't squeeze the Charmin. If we can get people <laughs> talking about it, it becomes something. But who in the world is going to squeeze toilet paper? Nobody. But people talked about it for years. Years. And and the same thing, if we can get people to actually read their Bibles and go to places where the Bible is actually taught, we won't have to fight against false teachers because nobody will be listening to them. There's no no you know no reason to 
uh, to do that and let the Lord handle that. He's he's well able to defend his word. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you, Rabbi and Thank Wayne. you. You're welcome. And I want to thank Herb in Georgia and Joy in Florida for uh, texting and letting us know that at this point the Internet does appear to be working right now. And Marshall, welcome to the program. How are we doing, sir? I'm doing wonderful. How are you doing? Just right. So, uh, hey, when it comes to the people being corrupted, I think anybody that votes Democrat, when they voted God off the platform, no Christian has any business checking anything with a D beside its name when they're completely against God. I can't argue that point. Matter okay. of fact, I, I do want to say something that I'm excited about on the Republican platform. And that is that this year's Republican platform is the most pro-Israel platform in the history of our nation. Well, people talk about being one issue and, and all of this. I'm, I'm kind of a three-issue guy. Mine is God first, guns because you have no rights if you lose the Second Amendment, then abortion in Israel. Those are my issues when it comes to voting. I understand, and, and, and it, I'm not a one-issue person either. Uh, you brought up the one issue. I, I'm pro-God, clearly, and uh, you know the Democratic Party had that thing with the take God out of the platform thing that went on last time, and it's still out this time. Um, so I, I vote on the issues that are biblical, that, that meet my values. Uh, I understand that unless you're voting for me, uh, you're not, unless I can vote for me, I'm not going to find someone that agrees with me on everything. Um, and so I, I'm going to vote for the person that most matches the values and things that I stand for and agree with and, uh, and the Constitution. You know, the, our country is based on the Constitution, and anybody that's anti the foundation of the country as far as our legal uh, precedents, uh, I can't vote for. Amen. Yeah, that's why I say uh, guns, because that's Second Amendment, and on that hang all the other amendments, because you can't protect them without that one. Yeah, so I that's, am a, my, that's my constitution. I am a strong <laughs> Second Amendment person. They, you, you have to be if you're going to be constitution. Yep. So and, uh, uh, I wanted to add one more thing. I know we'll disagree on this, but I think a great deal of problem with the Christians all throughout everything is the preachers have no authority. They had it took from them at the seminary, and every verse. And every word and every doctrine is questioned in the Bible. We have 250 American Bibles out there. They all contradict each other. And so the authority of the Word of God has been destroyed. And because of that, if you have no authority, there you go. Well, I don't know where you where we would disagree on that with, except if you're saying that there's one perfect Bible that everybody should follow. Uh, we would have discussion about that, but I believe that the authority of the pastor, of the of the leader of congregations, has been larger. We talked about the... I mean, there are so many pastors that are ruled by a board that, that their paycheck uh, determines, and, uh, you know, they, they preach what they're told they have to preach because that's what the board tells them to do. And uh, the authority of, of people of faith has been diminished in our country. And, well, uh, my, my, my thing about a perfect Bible is, if you don't know whether First John 5, 7, and 8 should be in there, the doctrine of the Trinity, the greatest verse, is in those two verses. And almost all the new Bibles that are out there take that verse out. And so you have to have well, a discussion that's, on which one the authority is. Well, some of them take that out, and some of them notate that it's not in all of the manuscripts. I, I think being honest about what's in the Bible and what's in the manuscripts is important. I think that when we look at things and we say, this, this verse is not in all of the manuscripts... I think people should be able to know that. I don't. I think that 
doing well, something. I don't, I don't mind them knowing that. The problem is the two manuscripts that are most often used for the new Bibles contain the Apocrypha in the Old Testament. And when people discuss that this verse isn't in all the text, they don't notify the people that the texts they're using are pro-Roman Catholic texts that have the Apocrypha in them. Well, that first of all, there is no whole text. So to say that correct, that, correct. So you're so absolutely, you're absolutely right. Okay, let me let me finish. There is no whole text. So every text that we use to base it, no matter which text, whether to Textus Receptus or the Nestle Alien or or whatever text you're using, you're using a partial text that is gathered together with other texts to get the full text that you're going to use. So to say that one is perfect or pure versus the other is not is, is one thing. And the fact that the Apocrypha is in some of that does not mean that the Apocrypha at that point was uh, canonized as to be part of that text. Just like if you went to uh, Qumran and you looked at all of the texts that were rolled up in the scrolls there, all of those were text, not all of those were accepted as scripture. And so there's a big difference between those things, but the I do appreciate your two, call. The two manuscripts that you were talking about have the Apocrypha in the text. No, they have the Apocrypha within the, the, the writings. It's not canonized. The original it's, King... it's one manuscript, and it contains the Apocrypha in the Old Testament, it's both a... in Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Okay, let's try again, because you agreed with me that they don't have a complete text, and then you're telling me that it's a whole text. No, you... I'm telling you it's a complete manuscript. It doesn't have all of everything in there. But the it can't the let, let, Marshall itself. Marshall let me let me try this again. You just said it's a complete text, but it doesn't have everything in it. Either it's complete, which means it has everything, or it's incomplete. You can't it's have a complete, but it includes the apocrypha. You but you can't have a complete text that doesn't have everything in it. That that's just contrary. It was complete. I said the text contains the apocrypha. As part of the text. Okay, when we get a chance, when we get a chance, we'll play back what you said uh, another time, and we'll get together for coffee and play it back because you you said it's a complete text, but it doesn't have everything in it. That's exactly your manuscript. It doesn't have all of the text, but the text that it contains contains the apocrypha. Is so? Is the is the problem the apocrypha? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying the problem is. When you're using that manuscript to correct my Bible, you're using a piece of junk to fix a Mercedes Benz. Well, that's again. We only have one minute left, so oh, we're not okay. going to be able to continue oh, we'll to too it. much in this discussion. But uh, I understand where you're coming from, Marshall, and I I disagree with you for a number of reasons. But we can talk about that another time. Thank all you right, all, everybody, for you. listening to the program. Uh, Shavua Tov. Have a great. Week. Shalom and Shavuto. In the beginning was God, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and all things came through Him. In the beginning was you, was your light, which was true light, which gives light to all in the world. The new